We made it to Revelation chapter 3. That didn't take long. <laughs> it's February now. Um, I knew going into this that chapters 2 and 3 would be slow because there's seven letters. You take them one at a time. And, um, but we're almost through the letters, and then we're going to get to where we take one chapter at a time, and we're going to go trucking through Revelation. Um, so today we're on letter... Uh, five of seven to the church in Sardis, and um, if you've got your UV version app, you've got your text there, or if you've got your actual Bible with a cover and pages, you can open it up. Um, mine's on page 1029. I don't know where yours is. Um, I want you to imagine a situation that kind of um, illustrate a point here this morning. Imagine this room full of men. Let's just imagine we're all having breakfast together. Um, Lots of noise, lots of laughter, lots of talking, lots of smell of food in the air. And let's imagine one man starts talking badly about another man's wife. Loudly enough for everyone at his table to hear. Do you feel awkward a bit, just me saying that? Yeah. Then imagine another guy over here goes, oh, yeah? You think his wife's bad, you should hear about his wife. Right? Another one, we'd never do that, right? But you can't imagine the awkwardness of that, right? Right? Well, what happened? It would be incredibly uncomfortable. Maybe a fight would break out. Maybe people would walk out of the room. Um, But I think that illustrates um, maybe what it's like when we talk about the church. Um, Because in the Bible, the church is described as the bride of Christ. So... Maybe we should be really, really careful how we talk about Jesus' bride. And it's easy. It's easy, right? Oh, well, that church over there and that church over there and this church over here, and right? And we forget we're talking about another man's wife. Um, and so we come to Revelation... And um, we've got Jesus writing letters to churches. And it's it's amazing that it's made public, you know. It's amazing we have these. There's seven of them, and they're real live historical churches. We could map them out for you in a nice little circle. Um, You could go today and see maybe where there's a city still there. They're real live churches, and as we see with real live churches 2,000 years ago, Not much has changed, right? Um, But just, it just struck me this week, um, when you read a a letter to a real life church, you're you're reading what Jesus thinks of the church. An actual church, an actual local church in a place at a certain time and the people in that church, in the context in which they were living, Jesus says, this is what I think about you. And it's almost like... Well, I know I should be reading this, but this just feels like something. Should I be reading this, right? Um, But in this case, um, there's a little extra something here. um, Because this is a church with a reputation. And when I say that, you go, ooh, a reputation. Because you immediately think it's a bad reputation. But it's not. This is, a, this is a church with a good reputation. So put your you know, thinking cap differently. Um, this is a church with a reputation, but it's a church with a reputation that did not match what Jesus saw in reality. And so Jesus writes a letter to a church that frankly is not doing anywhere near as well as it thinks it is. And we talk about 
these letters, they follow a certain format. Like it's, this is who's writing to you and there's this description of Jesus. And then he's like, this is what I know about you. And this is what's going really well. And this is what is not going so well. But here's a promise uh, for you to keep being faithful. Um, And then he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Um, And unfortunately, Jesus just jumps right into the bad stuff on this one. And um, it's not the last time it's going to happen. But out of, out of all the letters that we're going to look at, this one is described as the most severe. So we get, we get to read a letter Jesus wrote to a church, and it's frankly pretty rough to read, right? Um, And they don't even seem to be a church that's suffering persecution like the other churches were. They seem to have it pretty decent. Um, There's an important lesson here about how we speak of the church and how we even think of ourselves in light of the world around us and what it might mean to wake up... um, to reality. So Revelation um, chapter 3, to the church in Sardis. Um, Go on around the circle, the trail, the road we follow to the next church. Sardis is a church um, up on a high hill, big uh, rocky outcropping, big wall. And you're going to know where I'm going with this when I say this. This is one of those cities that thought it was impenetrable. Nobody can defeat Sardis. If you've read your Bible enough, you know what happens to cities that say we're undefeatable. Yeah, they get defeated. And so a couple of times in their history, they were uh, just, in fact, defeated. As a matter of fact, if you go to your, back to your Old Testament, you remember this guy, um, Persian King Cyrus. He went and attacked Sardis and defeated Sardis, and um, here they are, uh, these years later, and they're being written this letter um, from the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, and we saw this back in chapter one. All these descriptions of Jesus come um, from chapter one, right? He says back here, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in our hands, the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And so here's this Jesus, that this is his church. We're just kind of getting to listen in on this letter he's written. And he just starts with the same two words. I know, I know, I know. And the first letter was, I know your works, and then it was, I know your tribulation, and then it's, I know where you live, and then it's, I know your works, and now we're back again to, I know your works. And apparently, they were busy doing lots of good works. Um, They were a church of works, and Jesus knows their works. Then he says this, you have a reputation of being alive, but... You are dead. Eek. Um, and we don't know, is this their reputation in, this, in Sardis, where they lived? Is it other churches around looking upon them? I don't know, but it was, when people talked about this church, they said, wow, that's a, that's a busy church. That's a church doing a lot of good things. That's a church that's just alive. That's a church where it's happening. It's a church doing good things. If you said, man, do you know, I'm looking for a church that's really alive. Sardis, that's your church. That's your church. Go there. Those people are alive. Doing some good stuff in Sardis. And it's just very frightening. Jesus says, no, you're dead. Now, this is the the opposite of, um, was it the church in Smyrna where he says, um, you have, you're known as a church of poverty, but you're rich. <laughs> it's the opposite. You're known as being alive, but you're dead. Now, if your reputation is life, and Jesus has an opposite, very, very drastically different idea 
what's behind your reputation, that means that their idea of life and their idea of success and their idea of what it really meant to be a vibrant church was the opposite of what Jesus meant to be a living, vibrant, successful church. And what a horrible thought, right, that this church is busy climbing this ladder. And as the old saying says, it's against the wrong wall. What a horrible thing for Jesus to show up and say, you guys are dead. Now, I'm careful here because this could just be doom and gloom. These people are hopeless. And number one, the fact that it's a church, and it's a church that Jesus, is it's his church, and the fact that he bothered writing them a letter tells me that it's not hopeless. So I, I want us to, to approach this not just as a big bad news letter, but as a letter where there's still hope. I've been, I've been reading Richard Sibbs. He's a, an old, old Puritan writer. And if you don't know who the, what that means, it just basically means you read a page of his book and you have no idea what you just read. And so you just go to the next page because it's just really, really hard to understand. But every once in a while you go, whoa, that was amazing, right? And so he's, just, he's got a book called The Bruised Reed, and it's all based on Matthew quotes Isaiah where the prophecy of Jesus is that a bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not snuff out. So in other words, when someone's just down to their last, like they're the reed and it's just, just about to break over, Jesus will be tender with that reed and will not will make sure it doesn't snap or that piece of flax has just got teeny tiny little ember of life left in it. He won't just, he'll, he'll fan it back to life. He's tender, he's merciful. And if he wasn't, he, there's a line in the book where he says, if Jesus wasn't merciful to the weak, there would be no such thing as a church because the church is full of weak people, right? So I mean, it's, I love that I've been reading that book at the same time here because I look at this and go, okay, well, there's hope. There's hope. And the hope is, verse 2, wake up. Wake up and strengthen what remains and, and is about to die. Now, that's interesting. He says, you're dead. And then he says, and strengthen what remains that is about to die. In other words, you're dead but there's some living pieces left. There's some smoking flax left. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Now that's interesting. Because there's two ways to read that. Incomplete works. What is an incomplete work? Like you started it and you didn't finish it. I know none of us have any idea what it's like to start a project and not finish it. So that can't possibly be it, right? Nobody has an unfinished project at all at their house. That's what I thought. Yeah, but, but, but he, there's, there's an interesting um, line in 1 Timothy where, he's, where he talks about that there's a certain type of, of work, an, an inward selfishness that, is, that produces a dead work. And if you look, this is right out of the Sermon on the Mount. Do you... You remember when he told the Pharisees, he said, you stand on the corner and you, you, you pray and you do that so that everybody will see you and you have your reward. And he said, and then you go and you give at the temple so that everybody will hear all your money falling in and like, ooh, look how generous. And you have your reward. And it's like those, those works are dead, right? And so there's this, there's this combination here of why and how we do works that can lead to those those works just being incomplete and dead works, right? Um, there's, there's a certain inwardness. You might even say that maybe they were doing the works in order to get the reputation, right? And, and it's like, well, okay, congratulations on the work, but... That's a half-hearted work. That's not a whole-hearted work. It's not a work you're giving yourself to for the right reasons. So you need to wake up and bring strength to what remains. And when the Bible says wake up, um, it means that someone's in danger. People who are asleep don't know they're in danger, right? You can do all sorts of stuff to people who sleep too hard, right? Um, I have stories from my own childhood. I was known for, for sleeping through things. 
Um, just in case my mom's watching, there's a story I won't tell. Um, but there's a story I, I will tell. Um, we, my dad and my brother and I, on a Saturday night, we had gone out to the, to the local dirt track for some good old East Tennessee dirt track racing on a Saturday night. I see David back there shaking his head. He's from East Tennessee. He knows what I'm talking about, right? Good family fun. The later you say, the more fun it is because by the end of the night, you got two guys named Leroy out there in their Vega and their Pinto that they welded a roll cage into. And by the end of the race, they're throwing their helmets at each other and fighting in the middle of the track. But whatever the case may be, we're out there, some good family fun. Me and my dad and my brother, we leave. I climb into the back seat and I fall asleep. And when I wake up, our car is surrounded by police officers, flashing lights everywhere. And there's a police officer talking to my dad, telling him, thank you. And I've been asleep, completely unaware to my surroundings. And my brother turns around and sees me wake up and says, oh, man, you missed it all. You missed it, man. We were going over 100, and we were chasing this guy. What <laughs> happened? Story goes, we're going along, drunk driver flies by my dad, side swipes this lady, runs her off the road. This is the day of CBs, and my dad, he's half stunt man anyway. He's like, oh yeah, game on. He gets on his CB and says, I'm chasing a drunk driver. We're on such and such road. Forms the police and chases the guy down until the police show up. I'm asleep. This is in the days. You didn't even think about a seat belt, right? Seat belt. Who does that, right? Maybe a lap belt, and I'm just conked out. Unaware of danger going on around me. Thank you, sir, for helping us catch this dangerous man. What, what did I miss? Yeah, um, that's the problem with being asleep. You don't know what you're missing. And the church of Sardis didn't know what they were missing. He says, wake up. You don't realize what danger you're in. You're dead. You don't know it. Even though your reputation says the opposite. Um, so let me just stop right here for just a moment and just, just think about this idea of just reputation waking up. I got a text from someone this week asking me, have you been listening to the rise and fall of Mars Hill? And I'm like, oh gosh, yes. Just waiting for the next one. And they're kind of done. There's some extra ones coming. If you're not listening, if you've not been listening to the rise and fall of Mars Hill, it's like a horror story taking place in a church. A church where God was doing amazing thing and people were coming to Jesus like crazy. And then it just went bad with a narcissistic, power-hungry, angry pastor who was just abusive and lives were just shattered and crushed along the way. It's, it's, a, it's a, a slow motion train wreck. But a very well-told story, and um, they, they interview all these people, and they interview the guy who says, the first words he says, I believe, in one of the interviews, my name is such and such, and I regret making him famous. Um, and he was the guy who was in charge of putting the first sermon online, back when that was kind of new. Some of you don't remember, there was this day when there were these things called cassette tapes, and if you wanted to listen to a sermon, you had to get one. Yeah, okay, whatever. Okay, but then they found this way to make them. So there was this guy who was like an expert in this, and, and they started putting these sermons online, and millions of people are listening, and they just started saying, here's all the money you want, film these things. Make them. And, and, and so they created this huge reputation and this huge image and made this whole thing worldwide famous to the point to where the pastor was saying to people, I don't know if you've heard, but I'm a big deal. Right? And um, it was just a, a well cultivated reputation. And Jesus says, no, there's, there's death happening here. There's death happening here. And so it's just kind of a warning to any church, really. It's like, are you, are you cultivating an image that you want the world to see something about you that isn't really true? And I just think the most beautiful example is what's happening in Creekside Hilltop Bible Church. It's like, um, they don't have a Facebook page. They don't have a web page. You can't download a sermon. They're, they're known in their community. They're known here, <laughs> right? Um, and then they're, they're being known, like there's people in Tennessee that I know that know about them now, and they're actually giving to help. And, 
you know, that's happening, but there's no well-crafted reputation happening there. Their reputation is, oh, they help poor people, and they'll block a dump truck if they have to. Um, <laughs> they're helping the poor, and there's girls going to school. That's an unusual, and they're preaching the gospel, and people are coming to Jesus, and they didn't craft anything. There's just life happening, right? And so that's, that's really our prayer, is that God would keep us awake to him, keep us awake and self-aware of what he's doing in our hearts and doing among us, so that we don't really have to craft a reputation at all. We just let our love for God and neighbor speak for itself. Now, what does waking up look like? This is good. There's, there's three things here. Uh, remember, keep, and repent. Um, remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. Um, so it's kind of like, hey, you remember when the apostles came through town? You remember you were discipled? Remember the, these, these elders were discipled? And you remember, you remember all, when the, all this was brand new and the gospel was brand new and amazing and fresh and God was doing all this brand new stuff and you guys were learning this brand new stuff and, and there was just life and, and you were just sharing the gospel. You remember that? You remember the first things? Remember that stuff you heard? Remember that, what you received? Okay, go back to that. Before you got a reputation, <laughs> go back to that and keep that. Go back and obey the stuff from the beginning. And then repent that somehow you went from there to here, from life to death. Just repent of whatever the apathy was, the sin was, whatever it was that caused you to drift from life to death, from life and love and obedience to halfway works. Remember, do that. <laughs> Repent. I don't know what this will look like for you. Um, there's like an eight-hour special out now about the Beatles. I've tried my best to like the Beatles, and I'm not doing, I, I can't, I don't know. So please don't throw anything at me. But <laughs> Peter Jackson, the Lord of the Rings the Hobbit dude, he made a, like an eight-hour documentary about the, the Beatles making their last album, and it's brutal because like George Harrison gets sick of it and walks out of the room and says, I'm done being a Beatle, and they're trying to bring him back, and they're trying to write songs because there's a deadline because they've got to do a concert, but they don't know what the concert's going to be, and, uh, and so they need inspiration. You know what they do? They go back and listen to their very first albums. And they go, what was it like when we were new and fresh and we just loved what we were doing and we were just doing it because we were young and we had the energy to do it and, and it was just, yes! What, what was the energy there, right? What was that? Just, I went, I went back last week and I found my first Bible. Not my first Bible. My first Bible was the King James that I didn't understand. I went back and found my first Bible that I did understand, and my dad gave it to me, and I, I, I just wore it out. And a friend had it redone in this nice ghost skin, so I went and pulled it off the shelf and just opened it up, and the pages were just all nice and broken in. And I was just looking at all the, the, all the verses I had highlighted and memorized all through it, and it was just like... It just seems that my faith was so much more simple then. Do you guys, am I getting, do you hear what I'm saying? Do you kind of remember when faith was just like alive and simple and there was nothing to prove and, and, and nothing to show and it just, it was just good and it was alive and it was fresh and just, life gets complicated, right? And the world gets crazy. Um, and then maybe you just kind of remember a place where it was like, yeah, this is maybe where I started this is kind of, uh, right, happened and whatever it is for you. And you can just kind of remember, well, maybe I just need to go back to that and just some of the original things I learned. I was learning to share the gospel. I was learning about my gifts. I was learning how to read the Bible. And I was learning how to pray and da-da-da-da-da. Learning about giving. Just all the stuff I learned in the beginning. Okay, just go back and do those things, right? And then just repent for complicating things or repent for sin, repent for drifting, whatever it was, whatever it needs to be for you. And that is the process of waking up and realizing your danger. And um, 
And then after verse 3, it just gets really complicated. (laughs) Revelation. Um, If you will not wake up, if you're going to stay asleep, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come against you. I'm going to break in your house. You're not even going to wake up. You're going to wake up, and all of your stuff's going to be gone. Um, Yet, you still have a few names in Sardis. People who have not soiled their garments. Isn't that an interesting little bit of terminology there? Um, And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I think we're all clear on those verses. Those are the easy parts, right? Yeah. <laughs> what did he say? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I keep coming across these verses that open up bigger themes. Like Jesus says, I'm going to come like a thief in the knife. Wait a minute, you're just going to come to this church? I thought that was when you came back like to everybody. Like you're just going to come back to Sardis where people are going to say, oh, look, it's Jesus. Wait, where is he going? Oh, I think he went to Sardis. Wait, I don't think that's how it's supposed to work. Can he go without going like we think of him going? Like can he, can he go without like being there bodily? Can he just say, I'm here and I'm messing, right? I'm going to wake you up and you're going to know. Suddenly you're going to realize you're dead. Fortunately, you've got a few people who are awake and he used this term, they haven't soiled their garments, which is, It's this idea of kind of this conformity to the world and letting the world just dirty you. Um, But they're going to walk with me in white, for they're worthy. And the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. Um, And I will never blot his name from the book of life. Um, For those of you who are in like the Wednesday morning Bible study, um, you know as, as one of, I have had a professor who used to say two things at the end of class. Um, your brains are full. He could just look around and say, wow, these people's brains are full. Class dismissed. And then he would say, um, all will be revealed, meaning just be patient and we'll get to the topic. So we're going to come to all these verses about people in white garments. And we're going to come to all these verses about overcomers. We're going to come to these people. Their robes were washed in the blood of the Lamb. They overcame him with the word of their testimony, right? These people in white. There's all these people in white all over... Revelation. And then we're going to have these verses about the book of life. And so I just want to tell you, please be patient. We'll get there. But there is this line here that just kind of makes you go, huh? I'll never blot his name for the book of life. And you ask that age-old question, does Jesus write with pencil? With an eraser at the end of it? <laughs> That one doesn't good enough. Didn't wake up. And when you look at the book of life, there's like four or five different ways in books and scripture. And oh my goodness. If you go back to just even the Old Testament, this idea of the book of life, that you were, you were written into God's chosen people and you were enjoying the benefits of, of being a citizen of a, of a nation that was led by God before they even had a king and messed things up, Right? You got your name blotted out of that book. You completely were not allowed to enjoy all the benefits of being a citizen of that nation. So maybe that's what it is. But there's there's one thing that's for sure. They didn't get their name in the book of life in the first place because they were good enough. Because it says it was written there way, 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 way before they were born. So it's not like oh, look, that one's doing well. I'll write their name down. Oh, nope, he messed up. It's not exactly how it works. As a matter of fact, he doesn't even say the opposite, right? Well, to the the conquerors, I'll write their name in, right? There's just these ideas, I believe, that are going to unfold in Revelation, but there's also these ideas, and I say this every week, these promises that will be fulfilled in the future, and we're going to see them when we see differently. We're going to see with Jesus' eyes, and we're going to go, oh, right? Because the truth is, we didn't even earn our white garments, right? 
will be clothed in white garments. So apparently he gives the garments. But there's this, there's these pictures in, in Sardis. The people in Sardis would have known. Like when the Roman army went out and fought a battle and they had this big victory, when they were coming back home, they would send a runner into the town or the city ahead of them and say, hey, listen, the generals, the commanders, they're all coming with the army and they've been victorious. You need to come out and celebrate. You need to. And so they'd put on their best white robes and they'd go stand out in the road. And when the army would come, it was like this big victory celebration. And if you were like an insider or you were a relative or you had some power, they would let you join in and like, be part of the party and be part of the parade like you had anything to do with it, right? So there's victory coming. There's white robes coming, and we'll get there. But just the picture of, I think the two things that I, th- the two lines that are really, really helpful is, will walk with me. They'll walk with me, which is what we get to do now, Right? And just this idea of Jesus before the Father, like surrounded by angels and saying, Father, angels, I'd like to present to you. That'll be a humbling thing. I don't think we'll strut. Yeah. Um, So we pray. Lord, give us an ear to hear the Spirit says to the churches. Why don't you pray with me now? Lord, um, we have promises that we, we get to watch unfold in the book of Revelation. And, and we have promises that really, there's, there's a bit of a mystery here that's inspiring. Like I want to hear Jesus announce my name. I want to be in on the victory. I want to have a name. I want to have a name in the kingdom to come if I never have a name in this world. So God, just in the room right now, would you just help us to just get back? Whatever it was, when life... Life is complicated, but walking with you doesn't have to be that way. And the world is just filled with difficulty. We live in difficult days. But our walk with you and our love for you doesn't have to be that way. And so just help us to simplify and to rest in Jesus and to repent for letting our walk be anything but that and letting our love be anything but that. Let our obedience be anything but that. Just wake us up. Wake us up, Lord. And if we realize, God, that we've just been guilty of, of crafting a reputation that maybe isn't ours, then open our eyes to it. God, we we want we really want to be a church that no matter what this world says, that you say that church is alive. And what everybody else thinks, we just don't give a rip. Our name is one thing. Our reputation can be another. (laughs) And you know our name. So help us to walk before you and be blameless. Let everybody else worry about themselves. But give us life. Give us life. Life that only your spirit can give. Life that only loving you and loving each other can give. Life that only just walking with Jesus into work and into school and just walking with Jesus wherever it is we go. That kind of life. And you just take care of everything. Lord, however it is we have to repent, help us to repent. However it is we have to grieve our lives now to get back to joy, help us to do that. To 
must work in our hearts to get us to that place. In Jesus' name.